Welcome to the final session of the day. Um, and uh, this is a session called Monitoring Final uh, Talk Session. There's a poster session afterwards, which please, great if you could come to. Uh, so this monitoring session's got some changes. So the first two speakers, unfortunately, haven't been able to make it. So we're shunting up the next four talks, simply. So we're going to start with Tom Hart, who's going to talk about time-lapse camera, derived measures of phenology and reproductive success in seabed research. Tom. Thank you. So I went home last night after Francis's talk, and I rewrote, or wrote, this talk, <laughs> thinking of what is the point of what I do, whereas why don't we all work at the Isle of May? The point is that we need to be more carrot-focused and have the outgroup that allows us to understand how carrots see the world. So thank you, Francis, for this. Overall, this is my goal. How do we take, how do we convert these low-energy activity sites and make them more important without fundamentally building bases everywhere? So how do we turn low into moderate. With a single visit, how do we get more value from a visit in terms of counts? What can we get in towards productivity? And pretty much, I think, with tech and imagination, we can do most things other than foraging behavior. So if you like, that is the, that's what I want you to have in your head. And because we need, we need more sites because this is a complex problem with multiple stressors that have positive and negative impacts. We've actually heard that in quite a few talks, that some of these act synergistically, some negatively. Uh, there are interactions, but some things act positively in one site and negatively in another. So the idea behind all of this is what can we do if we can only visit somewhere once? In the Antarctic, actually, a huge number of sites in very remote places are visited once a year. So if we can reverse engineer our entire science around that three-hour visit and we can hitchhike or get there for an hour or three, what could we do? And how close can we get to the Isle of May off that? Now, here we have a camera, the top one taking a photo every hour throughout the year, the bottom one taking one every minute to try and get nest attendance, and we've also got a, a snow melt experiment in the foreground. Those cameras are off the shelf. Um, these ones are a bit more bespoke. We also, we have been, uh, the problem of flying seabirds and cliff nesting seabirds is that you can't get so close. So with the help of time-lapse systems and Ellie Owen, uh, we've now got some uh, some zoom cameras that can get in close even if you're up to, say, 100 meters away. What are we getting? Well, it's, it's things like this. We're getting the background. We're getting the environment. We're getting temperature. And we're getting daily observations of the timing, like this, of breeding and potentially things like reproductive success. But the point is, we could do that, that, that doesn't exist one on one. The point is, what can we do if we replicate this across time and space? And how does that spatial replication allow us to do landscape level science? Uh, both in the south, we have roughly 140 cameras over about 100 sites. In the north, the ones I haven't labeled, those are taking uh, Tico and Annette's sites for granted. Um, but uh, we're starting to get there in the north. And the beauty, of course, is that we could reach out to more and more collaborators. And hopefully we will um, be able to engage with more people because it's simple to host a camera. What happens to the data? Well, straight out of the box, it's not as hard as you think. We have citizen science protocols that work. For, in the case of penguins and kittiwakes and guillemots, each image gets seen by 10 volunteers. Those get clustered into a hierarchical cluster and then aggregated. So here you see that C is a rock, 
Two people have misidentified it as a penguin lying down. That is removed in the clustering because only two people have seen it, and an average of the coordinates will be taken for A and B. We start to get things like this across some very remote sites that have had no data collected from them. So here we have the arrival date, the departure. We can split that out into chicks and adults, but also details that a couple of people have mentioned in terms of the sensitivity of the timing between different life stages within the breeding season. I'm not going to steal Nacho's thunder, but this is a lot thanks to um, uh, Fiona Jones and Nacho um, Martinez, uh, and they will talk about that later. So here we have colony-level data for adult kittiwakes, adult guillemots, and the chicks. So potentially something getting towards a cruder productivity measure as well. Can we automate this? Well, yes. So from several million annotations on Penguin Watch, we've been able to train an algorithm called Pengbot, imaginatively. And um, you can see now that has also encouraged us to collect a lot more data. So we're now taking, in some cases, photos every minute. The crazy thing about this, if you look at this one, this is a pair that is abandoning the nest intermittently. We can tell those birds are going to fail long before they abandon. And equally, we can tell which ones are going to be successful from their attendance patterns. The gold standard for this is to put it into a mark recapture model, looking for missing values. So if we see a chick on day three and day eight, it was clearly still there on, on day five. And this is the kind of thing we get at. Um, we look at the chick survival over time, and it turns out when we do this in a GLM, uh, so far fishing has not been significant, tourism has not been significant, but weather, and particularly extreme weather events, are significant. I should point out for all of that, that is only so far for Gentoo penguins, which are largely climate change winners. They're local foragers. We don't expect them to be impacted by fishing. So the real test will come when we repeat this for Adelis and Chinstrats. So the next part, I want to think about what we need. Where's next? We have this mass of data. I genuinely don't know how many images we have anymore, but it's in the millions which is therefore in the tens of millions of individual uh, nest-based images. That target, that's the bit we need to protect, archive, and make available to you. There's no point in us all replicating this. This is the kind of thing we need a community-level support for. We equally, we have developed quite a lot of machine learning. It works really well for penguins. It sort of works for kittiwakes and guillemots. So that's the bit that we need to make available on a platform that people can access rather than reinventing. The citizen science, that works. The expert, I couldn't find an expert. I put Mark in as placeholder. Um, that human in the loop and the expert in the loop is something that we need to maintain for quality control, um, for generating new parameters. And then, of course, between them, that comes out into science. Another reason we need a common framework for this is occasionally there's, there's judder or the camera moves a bit. And that's something that we've now got working via our collaborator, Carlos Artita, and we can automatically remove the shake so that when we're zooming in nest by nest, that's all done for us and it's standardized. So the final thing is really where do we go from here? What do we need? And this is where I think we need to think about what this means for ecology and large-level conservation. This is the most visited site in Antarctica. In a normal, visit, uh, in a normal year, Port Lockroy would have about 30 or 40,000 visitors. In 2020, it had nine. But the camera network kept going. So we have data throughout the Southern Ocean from that period of COVID. And as a result, that removal of tourism 
has formed part of quite a nice natural experiment that then allows us to tease apart what is going on more with fishing and climate change. And the climate change component of this is what Nacho will talk about later. Going away towards proper experiments from natural, it turns out we have quite a few volcanoes in the Southern Ocean as well, which are turning out to be really nice proxies for climate change. So we have paired heated and unheated sites where, where birds nest by nest are experiencing very different local temperatures at their breeding sites. And we, we're starting to look at what that means for their microbiome and the pathogens they experience at the nest. It's not, and the other thing that Francis said yesterday was temperature, you can't eat temperature. That's very true. But if you can measure it at the nest, then you start to tease apart what is going on remotely from the nest in foraging and what is going on at the nest. So these direct versus indirect fitnesses, uh, fitness consequences of climate change is, I think, what we need to get to. So we've, we've trialed a couple of thermal image time-lapse cameras, and I would love to start rolling these out in the north as well. And this, because there's always an ask with my talks, uh, this is the ask. Here's where I think we need to go if we are actually going to disentangle effects of climate change in the north. And this, I would like us to try and think of sites where we could heat seabirds. We, we have in some of our homes uh, infrared radiators. We could very gently, by a degree or two, heat up some nests and maintain others at ambient and ex get towards an experimental manipulation to, to remove a lot of the environmental variation that at the moment confounds our ideas on climate change. Added to which, and something we're very much trying to do in the Southern Ocean, we could further complement this by, by experimental closures, by starting to think of marine protected areas as experiments rather than, uh, rather than just as protection. If we, if we have the experiment designed for when an MPA comes into place, that might actually help us understand what's going on. And with that, thank you. Um, <laughs> Can I just point out that is entirely accidental. I've never practiced this talk. I was writing it about two hours ago. Fantastic. Thank you, Tom. And, and I, 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 it chimes with us because we wouldn't have had a 2020 Guillemot breeding success measure without cameras. Uh, any questions for Tom? Right at the back. Hi. Um, great talk. Um, I was just wondering if you've thought about using a biophysical model to monitor heat stress rather than actually heating the environment and exposing the birds themselves to that. Uh, very much. We could certainly look at, I suppose the point is, can, can we have an experiment? So yes, we can do that. We're starting to think about the, heat but the temperature buttons within nests and things like that. Uh, we're short of modelers. Um, I think there's huge scope within these data for, for someone to contribute that to a study. So, yeah, for the, the future PhDs or postdocs or collaborators, yeah, we, we actually need that. We don't have that right now. Thank you. There's two others at the back there, and then we'll move on after those two, I think. Um, great talk, thank you. I just wondered why it was harder to identify kittiwakes and guillemots than penguins uh, in the images. Uh, oh, it's hard, slightly harder to, uh, we were lucky with the AI, if that's what you mean, because we had someone who developed DeepMind in Oxford. Um, the first problem he was really interested in, the second less so. Um, but it's getting within re re reach of us as, as numerate ecologists. But it's worse than kittiwakes and guillemots because they occlude each other. Uh, if you have a taller pole, you can see penguins separated. Um, so that's largely why. Hi. 
Hi, thank you. That was a fab talk with lots of lovely videos and time-lapse footage. Um, so I'm just interested in a more practical question about the kind of the cost of these camera setups, like um, the practical implications, like how often do you have to go and get the data off it or does it send it to you nicely, um, the maintenance requirements. So it'd be really cool to put lots of these cameras all around these sites so it's just an, a rough idea of cost and maintenance required. I would say... Um the tripod you're looking at, something like 60 quid. For an off-the-shelf camera, something like 500. And if it's not too cold that you can use rechargeables, that's about 60 for the setup. Um, for the zoom cameras, they can come with uh, 4G, 5G, sorry, um, and they can transmit to you uh, if you're on a cell network. Those are, we're still getting a discount on them, but they're around about two grand. Um, all of these, we only go to get them once a year. And that doesn't need to be in the breeding season once you've aligned it. So that's the point for avian influenza, the point to avoid disturbance if they're a particularly flighty bird. Um, but yeah, once a year will do fine. One of our cameras in Svalbard we didn't see for four years during the pandemic and it was still going uh, this June. Brilliant. Tom, thanks very much for an excellent talk. So our next speaker is Manon Clerbault, who's going to talk about decolonizing Arctic science involving local communities while reinforce ecologically sound pan-Arctic seabird monitoring. Manon, over to you. So hi everyone, my name is Manon Clerbeau, I'm a postdoc here at UCC, but today I will present work that I did with David Grimier and the Seabird Working Group at the Conservation for Arctic Fauna and Flora uh, group, and which is mainly about how we could reinforce ecologically sound pernatic seabird monitoring involving local communities in a context of uh, decolonization of Arctic science. So, as some of you may know, Arctic is this huge territory that uh, seven nations share for the best and for the worst, uh, trying to take the best part of huge reserve of gas, petrol, natural resources, bringing a lot of geopolitical tension, but a good story about that is that Arctic research is a good example of how we can inter internationally collaborate uh, through working groups such as the protection of the Arctic marine environment, the Sustain Sustainable Development Working Group, or Arctic Contaminant Action Programs, and also through monitoring networks where scientists uh, share data, share methods, and it's what uh, they are currently doing during the Circumpolar Seabirds Monitoring Plan uh, to improve um, the status of seabirds population in Arctic. We all know that seabirds are sentinel of environmental changes and ecological indicators, so that's why uh, such monitoring plan got great conservation values. And we got an example here with um, key sites all around the Arctic and their degree of implementation. But unfortunately, such plan uh, didn't have been assessed and are mostly conducted by Western scientists. So there is also a strong call to involve Arctic people at all stages of the monitoring process. And so the question today is how could Arctic seabed monitoring be improved involved, involving uh, local communities? So to answer this question, uh, we wanted to assess one uh, of the species that take part of the monitoring network, the Black Lake Kittiwake, uh, because the Black Lake, the Black Lake Kittiwake uh, is a vulnerable species which suffered from a huge decline um, since, the, since the 70s, um, and which is one of the most studied species in the Arctic after the Brunic Guillemot and the common eaters. So here is the monitoring uh, network in red uh, in the Arctic across the 22 equal region in red, so 71 colonies, among the 1,300 known colony uh, up there. And what we do to assess this monitoring network, uh, we wanted to know if this plan got a good coverage of the environmental gradients that the species experience. So we extract at each colony current and future environmental variables 
and then decided to compare the distribution of those variables at known and monitored colonies. So we did that through histogram and also calculating uh, beta Sharia coefficient to know uh, what was the likelihood of the distribution to overlap. And finally, after having this, uh, we were able to identify environmental values which were under or oversampled across the Arctic and to obtain such map to fill the gap. Uh, another thing we wanted to do was to assess if the accessibility of colony uh, was impacting its likelihood to be monitored. So to test that, we did a GLM, including sea ice concentration, minimum distance to the coast, distance to the closest human settlement, and also the distance to the closest research station. So our first result, which, uh, which is um, that the monitoring is inevitably distributed um, in, among the 22 Arctic region. So you get, for example, in Alaska and the Aleutian Islands, uh, which count for more than 60%, 16% of the known colony, only 3% of the monitored colony are there. And it's the opposite, for example, in Nunavut and Western uh, Greenland, which account for 6% of, of the known colony, but for more than 90% of the monitored one. But despite this unevenly distribution, a really good surprise uh, and a good news uh, for the monitoring plan, it is because we get good coverage of overall environmental condition experienced by the kitty wakes. A um, lot of uh, variables got a pretty high beta Shaya, um, coefficient, meaning that the distribution the, of the variable between known and monitored colony overlap, non significantly but pretty good. But there is still improvements that remain possible. For example, this is a difference of average summer temperature between now and the mid-century, according to the climatic scenario. And as you can see, um, there is um, an undersampling of a colony where the global warming will be the highest, which corresponds to the Aleutian and Alaskan Highlands, the Bering Sea, uh, Western Russia, some um, colony in uh, Franz Josef Land, North and Norway, and sometime in the Susan Iceland. Uh, another result was that the colony accessibility didn't seem to appear as a main criteria when choosing to monitor a site or not. But digging a bit more into this, we found that more than 70% of the Kitiway colony are less than 50 kilometers away from uninhabited places. So in average, the monitored colony were um, nearly to 40 kilometers away from the closest human settlement, and it's nearly the double for a monitored colonies. And it's, for example, for monitored colonies, there is five places in Arctic uh, which are the closest human settlement of up to 24% of the monitored colony. So there is one in Norway, there is one in Iceland, and three in Greenland, and sorry, I won't try to say it properly because it will be a massacre. Um, and it's also the case for unmonitored colony. Fortunately, there is places that are really close uh, to unmonitored one. For example, there is places in the Bering Sea, the Aleutian Islands, or Western Russia that are uh, less than 15 kilometers away from a um, uh, a colony. So highlighting the fact that if we want to involve local community, it's possible based on, on distance. And monitored colony are also 10 times closer to a village than a research station. Uh, for example, here, for monitored and unmonitored colony, they are around 400 kilometers away from a research station. That highlighting the fact that it's so hard and the huge logical constraints that scientists face when they want to monitor the colony in Arctic. And also the fact that it's a, it could be a good strategy to involve more uh, local people instead of trying to reach such research, research station. So in the conclusion, this monitoring network is doing a fair job considering the important constraints, logistic, the, the money, the, the person we need to train in order to reach the Arctic and to work here. Uh, it's also a strong pot potential for establishing community-based monitoring and research program in a context where uh, there is a call to decolonize Arctic science and to allow people uh, living here, living there, sorry, to, to self-empowerment uh, and for self-determination. But there is some limit to our method. For example, we didn't consider a really fine scale variable, such as the fact that Kitty Wake, for example, nests on cliff 
Uh, we didn't have the difference between cliff nesting kittiwake or those that were nesting in suburban area, but clearly the safety to reach them is not the same. Um, there is also some bias we didn't take into account, unfortunately, which was the colony size or the fact that some uh, kittiwake colony could be close uh, to other seabird species, so that might be interesting for some scientists to choose those colonies rather than others. And there is other parameters that could influence scientists' choice. For example, some of you may be, might be interested by the fact that a colony is really far away from an inhabited places just to remove potential anthropogenic impacts on this, on this colony. Further, we really acknowledge the fact that special proximity definitely is not enough to involve local uh, communities. That needs training, that needs partnership building, that needs funding. But it's a first step to identify uh, where people are more likely to be involved in the future to maintain and improve the monitoring network. And so what's next? What can we do? Um, there is already scientists among, among us that are um, using an uh, indigenous knowledge that promotes citizen science. Um, but what we really need, even if some of us are doing the job, is real collaboration in Arctic with Arctic peoples uh, through uh, in, um, involving Arctic people since day one, so building projects, um, making them able to record data, to analyze them, recognize uh, their work uh, by co-authorship, and um, also to allow them to disseminate uh, results outside and inside the community. So yeah, that's uh, the, the road that we, we need to follow now. So thank you so much for your attention. Uh, I also want to thank the numerous co-authors of my, of my work that um, helped me in these studies. And I'm at your disposal if you have any questions. Thank you very much, Manon. Any questions? Yes. I'm quite surprised to, to see the, oh, uh, the, the fact that uh, a uh, PLK colony is not a matter of distance, in fact. Just uh, look at the number of urban colonies of this species on, on the lack of interest by the, community, the scientific communities to this site is, is really uh, understandable for me. So the, I, I would like to have some insight about whether these sites are not well studied or even well considered or even not valued by the, the citizen on, on the urban planner, on the community of scientists. It probably depends on many things. For example, if we are actually looking for um, anthropogenic impact on art, uh, the size of those colonies, sometimes they may be not worth it. Uh, just in terms of conservation value for the species. Um, and also, in this study, we considered the seabirds monitoring plan, which was a snapshot in 2015, so things may change also, and something might already be different. Um, and we got a definition of what we considered as a monitoring site, uh, meaning that, for, in this case, those sites uh, where those uh, part of the of the monitoring program where diet, productivity, and also data about phenology uh, were measured. So that might also explain why those suburban colonies were not yet taken into account. If it's a word question. Any more questions? Yes, at the back. Hi, great talk. Um, I wanted to ask if you have an idea of what the current involvement of local communities is. Um, are there people that are employed to be research assistants or anything like that? Thanks. So personally, uh, when I did field work, uh, we were uh, working uh, in the logistic part with uh, the Inuit community. There is people in this room that are part of this uh, work that already uh, work with local community. Um, and for example, I was thinking about Fleming Merkel. There is also Mark Mallory uh, and Jennifer Provencher that are uh, really um, building projects with them. But there is many other people that are already uh, doing that. 
If I can, if I can just ask you to elaborate on, on some of your take-home messages. I mean, some, a really important demonstration of the lack of representation of some important parts of the range. So, really nice result. And it was more to just understand a little better your thoughts on how best this engagement might work. Because I, I was listening to your talk and thinking, we just heard Tom talking about cameras and one visit. Is that the sort of thing where local communities either take that on or perhaps a host a visitor? Or were you thinking more traditional techniques where they're counting physically or recording things physically? No, clearly both work. I mean, if Tom, for example, wants more uh, camera in the Arctic, those uh, Arctic community can clearly be involved. They know much better than us uh, sometimes where find uh, species and also we, they, they, they can be trained and they, at one stage we will have Arctic uh, people that will be researcher, I hope so, and they will decide with who and or with what project they, they will develop uh, in, in the Arctic. So both approach could be, could be nice, but for camera is definitely a first easy step we can, we can already do. Great. And all thanks very much. So our next speaker is Alice Edney, who will talk about latitudinal and climatic effects on the breeding phenology of a declining seabird. Alice, thanks. Cool. Uh, thank you. So I'm Alice, and I'm a PhD student actually with Tom at the University of Oxford. Um, I'll try not to overlap too much with what he said, um, but I'll be talking about some of the results that I've achieved so far in my PhD. Um, so specifically, my PhD is mainly focusing on the black-legged kittiwake, um, which, as we all know, is classed as vulnerable on the IUCN Red List. Um, and the sort of aim of my PhD is to try and understand how the effects of latitude and the environment are affecting things like kittiwake phenology, breeding success, and nest survival to ultimately better understand why they are declining. Um, now, a lot of work has already been going into this sort of monitoring, um, but in particular, and as already mentioned, we're trying to really expand the spatial and temporal scale of monitoring using uh, a camera network. Um, some of the advantages of this are that we can do it over very large areas quite efficiently and quite cheaply. Um, and we can also get quite fine resolution data. So by taking photos once an hour um, throughout the day across the breeding season all year round, we can really start to try and understand some of the factors that might be at play here. Um, looking at the map that's uh, present on the board, the sort of orangey red sites are ones where there's currently sufficient data to be used uh, in the analysis I'm going to present. Um, and the grey sites are where we've either put cameras out this year or perhaps in past years, but we haven't yet processed the data. Um, so more data is always on the way. Um, now, as mentioned, we are mainly using at the moment a citizen science project called Seabed Watch to analyse all of the images. Um, because it would be obviously be way too much for me to do myself. Um, and this is hosted on a website known as the Zooniverse. It has loads and loads of different uh, citizen science projects on there. Um, but we specifically ask people to go on and essentially just click on all of the adult and juvenile kitty wakes in guillemots. Um, we use a hierarchical clustering technique to try and get one consensus click per bird. Um, so as mentioned by Tom, to try and increase accuracy, we ask that 10 users look at every image that contains birds. Um, and then by clustering this, we hope to remove any erroneous marks um, and get one click per bird, which is the ultimate aim. Um, this can produce graphs as shown on the board at uh, quite a coarse scale. Um, the y-axis is giving the number of birds um, across time, which is x-axis. Uh, the different colours are different seasons, and the panels just represent different sites arranged in latitudinal order from the low latitude at the bottom uh, up to the higher latitude at the top. Um, the side on, well, I was going to say the left, but I guess it's your right maybe, um, is adults, and then the other side uh, is for chicks. Um, and based on that, what my first step was to do is to try and use some of this data to look at how latitude in the environment might affect kitty wake phenology. Um, specifically, my first step is looking at the colony level. Um, so this isn't looking actually at individual kittiwake nests, but instead trying to get broad scale metrics of arrival and departure just by looking at the entire colony. So when the colony arrives and when the colony departs, 
Um, and this is quite important to get sort of a standardized method to be able to identify changes, uh, changes in phenology. Um, a lot of studies use different methods like mixing, for example, egg, egg laying with uh, hatching. Um, and so we wanted to see if we were just to take our images and look at the colony level, do we get the same trends that previous studies have shown? Um, we predicted, based on previous work, that arrival and departure would both get later with increased latitudes, um, but the magnitude of change in departure would be smaller than the magnitude of change in arrival, such that um, at high latitudes you get a shorter breeding season length. Now, uh, one of the problems with our data uh, is this. It looks very cute. It's quite nice when you see a photo like this. Um, it's actually extremely frustrating because all of the birds behind this big bird in the front are just obscured. Um, and so what you have is you'll have a nice time series of, say, consistent numbers, perhaps, of adults and chicks in the breeding season, obviously chicks increasing and, you know, lots going on there. But then you'll just get these random dips, and the data is ultimately very noisy. Um, all it takes is like a drop of mist or a bird in the foreground to suddenly result in the number of birds becoming very low or uh, becoming zero. Um, and it just means that the data is generally quite hard to understand and interpret. Um, and so the first step was just to try and smooth out some of this noise um, and just smooth the data so that we can better understand the trends taking place. Um, I tested different moving averages and smoothing methods, um, and I found that in general the best uh, method across all of our sites and across all of our years was just to use a three-day moving average. Um, this reduced the noise sufficiently that the data was much more usable and manageable, um, but it still kept the intricacies without just wiping out all of the important information. Um, from this, you're just able to quickly look at the images um, and just understand, sort of check basically that um, you've done it right and that it generally works um, and can produce simple uh, animations like this just to get a better idea. Um, it can be quite hard to validate um, whether you think that what you've seen is correct because there are hundreds of thousands of images, um, but through a variety of methods we can get quite accurate results. Um, and then I needed to come up with a way to define overall colony arrival and departure. Um, I tested lots of different methods to see what would be best um, and found that in general, the, across again all of our sites and all of our years, arrival was best defined as the first X days of consecutive increase um, and departure as the last X days of consecutive decrease. Um, the blue lines show arrival when you use different numbers of days, so for example using two days of consecutive increase uh, up to like seven days of consecutive increase um, and departure is shown as the lines in black. And this is just an example site from Ireland um, plotting the number of birds um, against time. Um, and overall across all of our study sites using three days of consecutive increase to define arrival and three days of consecutive decrease to define departure uh, worked well. Um, one of the challenges was finding a metric that is reproducible across all of our sites because you don't want to you know, go in and have to do it manually for all of them. Um, but using three days seemed to generally work the best. Um, and then we were able to essentially show uh, what we originally predicted and what would be expected based on previous studies, uh, that both arrival and departure do uh, get later as you increase latitudes, um, but breeding season length does get shorter. Um, and so this was quite a good way to just provisionally look at the data and find a reproducible method that can look at ketuate phenology at the colony level. Um, but obviously the next steps are to look at breeding success and nest survival um, and understand the effect of environmental change or gradients um, on, on kitty wakes. Um, now to do this, obviously individual level analysis is required as has been mentioned throughout this conference. Um, and so this is really what I'm working on now, finding ways to accurately define individual nests um, and then be able to extract information like uh, the first time an adult is present at a nest, um, perhaps the first time that two adults are present, which might give an idea of parental synchrony. Um, also looking at perhaps when chicks hatch, when they fledge, um, which will ultimately get us um, understanding about kitty wake productivity. Um, as Tom mentioned, some of the challenges of this are that the images can shift around and move, and so what you might have defined as a nest in one image is suddenly halfway across the screen, seemingly, in the next image. Um, and so we've been working with some computer scientists to try and shift, identify local like, key points in images that are consistent, and then shift images uh, according to that. Um, so that's sort of something that we're looking at now. Um, and also always trying to make sure that we're going back and validating the citizen science data. 
Um, although it's generally very good, it's not always quite as good um, when we're looking at data for chicks. And occasionally you get more than one point on a bird rather than uh, just the one. So we're always trying to basically improve that and make sure that it's still giving us the results we want. Um, but at the colony level, it's definitely uh, currently working. And so I'd just like to thank uh, a lot of people for making this work possible, uh, mainly obviously the collaborators who are hosting cameras at their local sites and are going out and getting images and sending them back to us, sometimes on memory sticks, sometimes over the internet, depends how hard it is. Um, and obviously all of the Zooniverse volunteers who are clicking on all these images and everyone else that makes this work possible. Thank you very much, Alice. Any questions? Yeah. Hi, thank you. Um, so my question is, are you able to pick up lay dates or sort of incubatory behaviors in the camera time-lapse footage? Um, and even also, are you able to distinguish when there um, isn't a chick because sometimes the birds are sitting on it or sometimes, you know what I mean? Mm, yeah. yeah. Um, in terms of lay dates, uh, I haven't really got to looking specifically, but I think that would be quite difficult because from looking at a lot of the images, it's very hard to see eggs. Um, as I guess as a, a seabird person, it would probably be possible for an individual to go in and identify perhaps when brooding behavior begins, um, like manually. But from sort of the citizen science perspective, we don't ask people to classify eggs because they're just not ever really visible. I've never seen an egg in an image. Um, so, so far, no. Um, I think that would definitely require like manually to go in um, and choose a site to look at. Um, and then, sorry, what was the second part? So, sort of, yeah, um, I think if because we have images that are taken every hour, um, I think across time, yes in that you would, if you don't see a chick one day, but then you could easily, you know, you might see it the next hour, you might not see it the next hour. Um, I guess a field worker can sit there and wait for slight movements to see it. But I think with fine scale enough data, then you can work out the probabilities of, you know, this chick has been seen five times in the last seven hours, so it's probably still there on the seventh hour type thing. And at some point make a cutoff of when you think the chick has actually died and is never seen again. Or hopefully fledges and is never seen again. <laughs> um. Any other questions? I wanted to, to ask you um, a more general question, I suppose, uh, which was about the when you're talking to hardware and software people about this, are the biggest sticking points at the moment with the camera technology, or is a bigger priority about the post-processing algorithms for analyzing the data, or, or is it both? Where do you think progress um, is most needed? I think for us it's definitely post-processing and imagery data. Um, there's just a lot of challenges that come up that you don't realize as you're working through them. Um, and even talking to sort of computer scientists and like machine learning people, um, for example, it can just be quite hard to identify the birds and images accurately based on the data we have. Um, particularly, I think a question before for Tom was asked about why is it harder to like automatically identify kitty wakes. Um, and it's partly because, yeah, they're so close together often. The, this, there's a lot more birds in the images, um, and so it's just a lot harder for that to happen. And so I think the camera technology at the moment is quite good, especially with like the big time-lapse ones, time-lapse systems ones that can zoom in up to like 50 times. It's definitely more for us, like the image processing side and getting the useful data out. Okay, thank you. Any final questions? Okay, thanks, Alice. Uh, our fourth talk today is Bernard Cadieu, who's going to talk about 50 years of investigations on European storm petrels in the Molen archipelago. Bernard. Thank you, Francis. Uh, oh, sorry. Hello, everybody. I will present a talk on the storm petrels, so in a total accordance with the very nice logo of the, of the conference. The study area 
is located in the Molen Archipelago in Western Brittany in France. And here is a brief history of the, of the story, of the beginning of the story. The first census was carried out in 1968 with an estimate of 250 apparently occupied sites. <coughs> and two years later, the second estimate was 270 AOS. Uh, an increase was recorded a few years later with, 19, uh, with four, 400 AOS, sorry. And a first map of breeding sites was also elaborated in the, in the 60s, and a ringing program was started also in the, in the 70s. From the 80s to the early 90s, um, ringing was continued, and there were some additional censuses with <coughs> about 200, 250 AOS. And during this period, a new map of breeding sites was also developed. In the middle of the <coughs> 90s, there was a period without any investigation in the colonies. And uh, in uh, 1992, the ERAS National Nature Reserve was created. 1997 was the beginning of the new period with the start of annual censuses and the relaunch of the ringing program. We have a lot of <coughs> annual activities with the monitoring <coughs> of breeding numbers, phenology and breeding success, um, predation by different species and colonies, and also by cats uh, outside colonies, collecting eggs for analy analysis of pollutants, as well as the uh, ringing of adults and the ringing of chicks on the, different, on the different colonies. Due to the large amount of data collected <coughs> during this period, uh, I will therefore only present a small part of our results by selecting a few, few highlights. After initial manual maps, <coughs> GPS was used to locate all the breeding sites with a centimetric accuracy. And we have now about um, 2,600 sites located for all the, for all the colonies. This location of building sites and the fine scale mapping are very important for field work and uh, monitoring. Census is conducted using different methods to identify the apparently occupied sites with <coughs> direct inspection of the site by hand or with a lamp, using playback to elicit the response of the, of the breeders, or using bureauscope in some, uh, in some building sites. A first period of increase has been recorded in the 90s, followed by a period of decrease. <coughs> and now there is an increasing, an increasing trend with about 920 AOS last year, even if hundreds of petrels are killed annually on colonies or outside colonies. And a large part of the French population of uh, storm petrels is located in the Molen Archipelago. But we don't know yet <coughs> what are the key factors explaining this evolution. Immigration, survival, food availability, we don't know. The mean building success is <coughs> about 53% with high interannual viability and varies according to hatching success and <coughs> fledging success. Linked to weather conditions, as well as food availability and also to predation on adults, the parents, or directly on the chicks when they move outside the burrows uh, at night. Mist netting at night is organized <coughs> with three sessions of three consecutive nights in June, July, and August around the new moon period, and always without using tape view. And we have known a few crazy nights uh, <coughs> with using only one mist net and <coughs> trapping about 350 birds during five hours. In one study colony, 
All breeding adults are ring or controlled. They are caught in the nest sites uh, in late incubation to avoid egg desertion. And all accessible chicks are ring in the different colonies. Since 1997, <coughs> about 26,000 birds have been ringed, out of which about 5,300 chicks, and I have broken two ring per year. Yeah, it's not a joke. And since the mid-70s, uh, the grand total is about uh, 31,000 birds ring on the colonies. On average, more than 200 chicks are ring annually, what is far much higher than the total for Britain and Ireland. And it's very important to have such cohorts of birds of known age and known origin. The story of this bird moving between Ireland and France <coughs> and rigged twice on the same lake is interesting to understand the question of wandering and birthplace. Indeed, for birds ringing as full ground, the ringing location doesn't provide any precise information on the origin of the birds. This ringing as many chicks as possible in different colonies appears as a priority in the future to assess dispersal and population dynamic of the species. The first return of young birds at the colony occurs at two, three years, with a few exceptional cases at one year. Return rate of birds ring as chicks and caught in mist nets is about 20%. But, interesting, the return rate is higher for birds born in the area where mist nets are located, and this return rate is lower for birds from the most distant colony. This is what's happened when young birds return to the colony. They don't fly randomly above the colony, but they clearly fly above the natal area. And the study colony of NS Cray's 101 cases of breeding of birds ring as chicks have been recorded. First time breeding occurs mainly at three to six years, with one exceptional case of a bird breeding at two years. And <coughs> the majority of birds originated from the same islets, with very few birds from the neighboring colonies. And there are few, uh, four cases of birds breeding in the natal site. But there are still some questions <coughs> about the occurrence of natal dispersal of birds from the Molin archipelago, as well as potential immigration of birds or foreign birds breeding in the Molin archipelago. Thus, once again, it's very important to ring as many chicks as possible. Here is an example of <coughs> history of breeders in one breeding site. The same birds the same bird breeds during at least 50 years in the site with two different partners, and afterwards, new pairs occupy this site every year. Our research shows that adult survival is 82%, juvenile survival is about 90%, and immature survival about 50%. Long longevity records of birds ring as full grown is <coughs> actually 34 years and 20 years for birds ring as chicks. We have some funny moments when one stormy is older than the people who hold it in the, in the hands. <laughs> this is in, in August this year. But stone petrels are still far from the longevity record of wisdom, the female albatross. Our more recent study starts in 2020 <coughs> using past track one gram GPS fixed on the tail of the bird to identify the foraging areas of breeders during incubation. Two main foraging areas have been identified. One in the southwest of the colonies <coughs> We are located submarine canyons on the edge of the continental shelf, and another one in the northwest of the colonies and in the south of the Isle of Scilly. During all this year, as far as possible, communication action towards the public are carried out, 
in the media, and we also try to publish our results. For the future, we hope to develop collaborative works to analyze the different data sets, as a huge amount of data is clearly underutilized due to lack of time and lack of dedicated funding. You can have a look of this uh, GNCC report published in July with a list of potential research opportunities on the, on the species. Our data sets are amongst uh, the few long-term studies on storm petrel and could be used to evaluate the response of the species facing global warming affecting the marine environment. A study of passive acoustic monitoring will also start next year with Biophonia. Improving knowledge about the diet, diets of the species is also in the list for the future. And we have planned to, look, to use GLS on building adults and checks before fledging to identify movement at sea, migratory behavior on, on wintering areas. And we also hope to be able to sex the birds from this sample because sex of the birds is one of the lacking data. Long-term monitoring is a human experience, and I'm very grateful to all the people involved, involved in field work, and especially all the volunteers, always, uh, <coughs> always motivated and a, in a good mood. Thank you. Thank you, Bernard. An excellent call to arms for all you storm petrol people to ring more chicks. Any questions? Yep. I thought we might have one from you. Thank you, Bernard. What a fantastic review of an amazing long-term study. Um, you've got a very large number of birds being killed by predators each year, and I just wondered whether your chick ringing program gives you insights into what life stages birds are typically being predated. Uh, yes, we have a lot of predators. The latest one is um, the barn hole on one of the smallest colonies. And predation in chicks is very low, but uh, in some years um, we have, <coughs> as this year, I have a lot of predation by great back, back girls and heron, uh, the gray heron in one of the colonies. Uh, with girls destroying the, the entrance of the burrows to, to catch the, the, the adults and chicks uh, in, the, in the burrow. But it's, it's very low. Most of the predation is on the wandering birds, young birds. We, <coughs> girls uh, found a lot of uh, rings for me, for, 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 uh, of birds aged uh, two and three years old, for example. And they also catch the, the oldest, oldest one that I don't, can't catch in the mist net because business are not located in all the area. Yeah. More questions? Yes, Sam. And, and... All right. Thank you. That was a really interesting talk, some incredible monitoring. Um, I was just wondering, because in this slide where you show the survival of the different age classes, you show that juveniles actually had higher survival rates than adults, which is kind of like the opposite of what yes. you see in others. <coughs> The data have have been uh, analyzed during a postdoc, and it's the first result of this analysis. analysis. And this is uh, one, of, uh, one of the analyses that we, we have to, to, to make an, an, to, approfund, uh, yeah, to improve, okay? Because um, it's really very strange, because you have uh, an inverted U-shape. You have a U-shape. Uh, for the um, survival, and it's really uh, very strange for seabird. So it's pre preliminary results. Okay. Thank you. Maybe it's the bar now, <laughs> killing all the adults. Um, your tracking data were very interesting. Um, are the seas sufficiently protected? For, to look after French storm petrels, or does something need to change? There are large protected marine area on the, um, on the, the edge of the continental shelf, uh, which has been defined for <coughs> large mam uh, marine mammals and, uh, and also seabirds. Uh, uh, it was not a surprise to see that storm petrel are uh, tra tra foraging on this area. Okay, but uh, the <coughs> 
this, this big protected area is uh, has been located uh, due to the necessity for the French government to, 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 to tell that they, they protect the marine environment. Yeah. You can increase the percent of the total uh, French marine area protected, but in, in fact, uh, this area are not protected as, uh, in many cases, you know. Any last questions? Bernard, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. So that is the end of the, the formal talks, talk section of this session, but we have three small contributions before we break for posters. Uh, over the, during the course of the session, given the absence of our first talk uh, by Kendra Colhoun, I was approached by Kieran Cronin, who whispered in my ear that he'd be happy to give a five-minute description of conservation detection dogs in seabird monitoring, and he's told me to say that it's very off the cuff and please bear with him but we agreed it would be useful for those of us that don't know anything about it just to get a sense of what it involves. So thank you very much Kieran for doing it at zero notice. You don't need the technology, this is the talk. Uh, Tom Hart thought he was doing well preparing his talk at one night's notice. I've had five minutes. So I didn't want to... I know um, lots of people have talked to me about detection dogs. And I saw that Kendra's talk uh, was scheduled and obviously not here. And I didn't want to let it go without introducing some of you to the, the concept of detection dogs, conservation detection dogs. I'm an ecological consultant. Uh, I have done a lot of seabird field work over the years. Uh, but for the last four years, we've been operating... Uh, training and operating conservation detection dogs here in Ireland. Uh, and I'm fascinated. And the more I learn, the more I do, the more passionate I'm becoming about this because it's a tool, I, I hesitate to say a technology, but a tool that has so many applications and so the, the, the possibilities are endless. So it's something that I'd like to just give you a very quick overview so that you can decide yourself if it's something that you might be able to use in your research uh, some of the ideas of how it operates. So, what would I, you know, if I if I'd had time to prepare a talk for you, <laughs> I might have called it the art and the science of detection dogs because there is an element of both. Um, and I know talking to a big bunch of scientists about art is maybe not the the way to win favour, <laughs> but you know, there are both components here. And the artistic component is that we're dealing with an animal that we have trouble communicating with. It's Dogs love us, we love them, but if we're trying to teach them a scent, a very particular scent, be that a very specific scent or a very generalized scent, and we can do both depending on the requirements of the work, how do we communicate to that animal? That's a very difficult thing to do. It's a difficult thing to do scientifically because we're not in the animal's brain. We're not understanding what that animal is sniffing and interpreting from what it's sniffing. So there's an artistic component in terms of how I, as a handler, communicate what I want in terms of scent to the dog. So when, when a dog is, is, is scenting a training aid, when we have a target scent and we have a sample of that scent, we can present it to the dog, the dog inhales that, he processes it, that scent is, has multiple thousands probably of, of different molecules, different components. And yes, we're going to reward the dog when he picks it up, but what component are we rewarding? It's not necessarily the strongest scent. Uh, it's not necessarily the most abundant scent. It's the scent that the dog is focusing on at that moment, which might be something that's just tasty or appealing or sexy or something. We, we don't know which component of that scent the dog is understanding. So our art then is to figure out how we, we bring that scent down, how we exclude all of the, the extraneous scents and focus the dog on the scent that, that we want. Now what we can do after that, we can bring in the science. So we can test the dog in a very scientific fashion. We can test its efficiency, its accuracy, all those different things to be sure that that dog is indicating and understanding the scent that we, we want it to. So there is a mixture of art and science and, and that's that's a beautiful thing to me. I, 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 it's, it's, it, it's, it gets away from the cold hard science. 
there's an element of, um, of working something out, or, you know, this kind of thing. And we have to work very closely with ecologists. I'm an ecologist myself, many dog handlers aren't. So if you're looking to employ a dog team or investigate or communicate with a dog team, you, the, you do need to have the input from the ecologist who understands the target and the dog team who understands the dog. Because rarely, unless you're me, of course, <laughs> rarely do you get a blend where both of those things can come together. So there needs to be a very clear communication. I can't talk to you about what Kenji was going to talk to you about. I don't really have many details of the project that he was on. Um, but what I can tell you is that we're, we're using dogs primarily for the, de 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 the detection of bat and bird carcasses at wind farms. Now, we have a few other top secret projects going on that we can't tell you about because we'd have to kill you. But um, even in, in that arena of bat and bird carcasses, um, what those dogs are capable of is absolutely mind-blowing. Uh, our dog, we have one German pointer. He's a big black dog. He'll come out of the van, out of the turbine. A few, in fact, last week. He came out of the van. Sometimes he'd come out of the van and he's jizzy and jazzy. He's ready to go. And we take off and we do our search and he'll find something or he won't. You know. Sometimes he comes out and he's just standing there. He's like, I, I, I can't be bothered. You know, now we have techniques. We can, we can work him up. What I've learned to realize over the last few years is that 90 times out of 100, that dog, when he steps out of the van, has a very good idea whether there's something there or not. And if he steps out of the van and he can't scent anything, he's thinking, oh, why bother, you know? <laughs> I already know there's nothing here. Now, sometimes he's wrong. We have to go through the system. We, we have to do the search. But mostly he's right. Uh, and I, it's something, that's another part of the art. It's something that I've seen more and more. He detected a bat. <laughs> we were standing 50 meters upwind of a wind turbine. There was a dead bat 20 meters on the other side of the wind turbine. So he detected that bat from 70 meters upwind. I don't know how that happens. Um, but he made a beeline. He went straight, straight for it. So, you know, it's, an, it's, a, it's a, a little known component, I suppose, of, of our ecological toolbox. Um, another thing I want to just lay to rest, uh, sorry, I'm not looking at time here, so give me a shout if I'm going on too long, is that we are dealing with professional dogs here. We're not dealing with pet dogs. Um, so get the idea, you know, of a dog running off and chasing rabbits or, you know, potentially eating your, your target species or attacking it or causing damage. Get that out of your head. That, we're not in that realm anymore, you know, when we're talking about professional conservation dogs. We can train these dogs to what we need. We can train them away from things that we don't need. We can train them to ignore sheep. We can train them to ignore people. We can do whatever we need to do. They're very malleable. The dogs are specifically selected for the job. So we go through a very rigorous selection process to make sure that the dog has the qualities and the, the abilities that we're going to need in it. Those are not necessarily the same qualities and abilities that make it a very good pet dog. You know, we want high drive dogs, we want really kind of mentally overloaded dogs almost um, that, are, that are easy to train because they're very keen on their reward. You know? uh, but that can make them very difficult to live with. So the marriage of a pet dog and a working dog is not necessarily a marriage made in heaven. Uh, we have to be a bit careful. Um, but like I say, you know, if you go to an airport, and I'd say most of you had carried heroin through airports at some stage in your career, <laughs> you start to walk down through the, the area, you see a detection dog coming out. I bet instinctively you have a very, very high degree of confidence. If that dog is attached to someone in a uniform, yeah, you will instinctively have a high degree of confidence that you're going to get caught with your heroin. You don't doubt it. You don't think about that when you're looking at police dogs, bomb detection dogs, explosive detection dogs, you know, dogs that are, are, are in war zones, sniffing out mines and sniffing out explosives that people are placing their lives in, in, in their hands or their paws. You don't, you don't doubt that. But yet, when we talk about a conservation detection dog, I keep coming across the same questions, you know, that, uh, you know, it's, it's a bit woolly. It's a, they're the same dogs. It's the same training. It's the same thing. Yeah. So we can operate to the same standard. Um, so it, there's one more thing, I suppose, that I, I want to um, just bring up. Obviously, we can train the dogs to very specific sense. We can train them off other sense. I'm thinking of something like storm petrels that we just heard about. Um, searching out storm petrel birds. It's not going to be useful in every situation. You know, if we have a dry stone wall where there's scent coming out all over the place from one nest, it might be very difficult for a dog to, you know, depending on the wind conditions or whatever, to, to locate where that nest is. It's not necessarily 
uh, a solution to everything, but if you have a borough, if you have a, a point target, uh, much, much easier, much, much, much more, um, much, much higher degree of success possible. Um, so, one of the newest developments, I suppose, in conservation detection dogs is the idea of multi-targeted surveys. So now we have dogs that are trained on one specific species, and I'm making this up off the top of my head, I'm just inventing this. Let's say we have a dog trained to find Manx Shearwater or Storm Petrol, or both. Yeah, so we can cover both species in the same survey. We could also cover potentially rat droppings, uh, stoat droppings, um, predator signs, barn owl pellets, you know, whatever it is that we need, we can put a number of scents on that dog. It can operate independently or together. So, you know, we talked earlier about in one of the presentations, about the, in, in Tom's one actually, about using a single visit to gather lots and lots of different data. There's another example. We can use our dog to collect lots and lots of different information on a single visit. Um, I'm going to leave it at that. I, I wanted to just give you an overview. Happy to take any questions. Um, and certainly very interested if anyone has any ideas in collaboration, just chatting it through. Wild Eye is the name of the company. You'll find me online. Um, if you just want to chat it through, just want to talk further about an idea, give us a call and we'll have a chat. Thanks so much for doing that at such short notice. I think what we'll do is to keep to time, we'll, we'll press on. If you don't mind, if you have any questions for Kieran, uh, you know what he looks like now. Go and find him, and I'm sure he'll be happy to answer those. So we've got two more things to cover before the break. So the BBC, I understand, want to say a short word about upcoming work. Hello. Um, thanks so much for um, letting me have just five minutes just to chat to you all in the same room. My name's Harry. Um, hopefully you've seen my flyer um, kind of dotted around and you'll see my poster uh, kind of crudely done last minute just in the poster presentation later. Um, I'm a researcher, um, not a research in the same sense as um, most of you guys, but I'm a researcher for the BBC Natural History unit. Um, some of you may or may not have worked with TV crews similar to ourselves, or you might have actually worked with the BBC um, before, but my job is to um, kind of chat to a lot of scientists and find new and exciting stories um, about our natural world. So, yeah, in short, our planet is changing. We all know that. So we've heard today about you know, stronger winds, uh, new diseases, uh, depleting resources, and you know these are issues that are at the very for forefront of, of our research at the moment. Blue Planet 2 was seen by over a billion people worldwide, and we, um, you know, the BBC has decided to go with Blue Planet 3, naming, uh, you know, very original, as, as we all know. Um, but we hope that these films uh, that we generate are able to highlight a lot of important uh, scientific research. And that's where kind of my job and um, why I'm here. That's why I'm here, basically. So we'll move on to the next one. Seabirds have featured in some amazing sequences um, in natural history documentaries. Um, I've just put a couple up here. Um, that were kind of my personal favorites. I'm not actually sure if maybe anyone in the room was involved with these. I apologize. Um, you, you know, we've got um, Lucy Quinn from the British Antarctic Survey um, was featured on Blue Planet 2 uh, last time. And so what we're doing then is we're interested to find new and exciting stories and it's really difficult because there's so much research and not every piece of research will fit into a, um, a filmmaking uh, story. Um, but it's, it's, I'm here to kind of listen to all ideas. There's no such thing as a bad idea, basically. And 
Um, you know, the BBC, we're focused on collaborating with researchers. I'm aware, you know, a film crew is quite a costly thing in both time and money, you know, whether you're doing field work or, you know, at these remote locations around the world. Um, I'd say, you know, we are up for collaboration, whether that's with helping with transport, equipment, uh, filming expertise, you know, seeing the talks with, you know, thermal camera time lapses. We've got crews that are kind of specialized in these uh, kind of evolving technologies, drones, things like that, and, you know, we are able to share data and collaborate in ways like that, and that's something that is, I'm really passionate about, actually, is kind of really getting the two uh, kind of mediums working together. Um, stories, then, I'd love to hear if you have a burning idea, a bit of a passion, a PhD project, a thing you've heard about, I want to hear it all. Please come and chat to me. Um, in general, we're looking at you know, new behaviors, cool technology, new and emerging issues. That's why I've been kind of going to a lot of the kind of different workshops and things yesterday. Um, and something that has a good visual component, but don't let, that isn't an exhaustive, exhaustive list. Um, you know, please come and approach me if you want. So, yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions um, if we have time, or if not, I'll be at the post session or at the pub later, so. Thanks, guys. Again, I think if you don't mind, we'll leave it that you go and find Harry down at the poster session because I want to allow time for our president, Liz, to finish off the session. Thanks, Liz. Okay, it's not just me. So I'd like to welcome members of XCOM to come down here as well. Show and tell of people, so you know who you're looking for when I mention the group a bit more. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, just wanted to tell you a little bit more about the Seabird Group. For some of you, this might be the first time you've come across us. So, essentially, as well as helping to deliver the conference on a biannual basis, um, we have a number of other major outputs, and that includes our journal, Seabird, and that tends to come out on an annual basis. And I just wanted to thank those of you who have stepped up to the role of editorial board. That's fantastic. We also appreciate those of you who are helping with the reviewing process. That's no mean feat. But I also really wanted to thank you for actually submitting papers, because without papers, the journal doesn't exist. So particularly researchers, we'd like you to you know, get your PhD students to consider submitting papers. There's some of the smaller work that you want to work on. It's very CPERD specific. But it's such a terrific project, you know, you know, product. I'd really like to keep it going. Another thing that we do is this, this newsletter, and that comes out three times a year. And I really love it. It's really nice reading about you know, your stories, the projects you're working on, hearing about the updates from the field season, and, you know, and reading about you as individuals. So we're doing spotlights on individual researchers, you may have noticed. Um, we've also launched a merchandise site. Um, so essentially, we're selling T-shirts and totes, and we've actually started raising quite a significant amount of money to help fund some of our work, including grants. Now, I know some of you will have applied for grants and got them, um, but we've also launched a new grant around you know, increasing opportunities of getting to Seabirds, like the Seabird Experience, which Leela's led on through the EDI work, which has been great. And we've had some really nice stories about people getting opportunities that they might not have otherwise done so because of you know, financial barriers. So we're trying to sort of knock down that being an issue for them. Um, if that hasn't convinced you to become a member, um, if you become a member of the, you know, the Seabird Group, you can do it online very easily, but you also get a number of online discounts, like Cotswold, for example. So that's worth doing as well. But it's just a really nice community to be part of. And if you haven't joined already, I would really seriously consider it. So normally, at a conference, we'd have an AGM. And we thought long and hard about this, and we decided no. Um, two things. It's been a long time since we've all met. And we thought it was just nicer to have you know, young researchers having the chance to present their work. And that was probably more important. So we took the hit. And we've also realized doing it online has actually opened up to a wider range of people. Sometimes not everyone can come to the conferences or come to Scottish Ringers, where it used to be you know, held in between the conferences. So we've had quite nice participation from the wider membership, so we're going to keep it going that way. But we are here. So welcome. The seven of us are here just at the moment on stage out of the eight of us. So there's 12 of us on XCOM. So unfortunately, Jeff Stratton, who does the website, 
Will Miles, who was doing the Seabird Sense who can't come, Viola, who does um, the journal, and Ian Cleansby, our treasurer, is not around. But the rest of us are here. Oh, yeah, there's, there's, yeah. Well, who's missing then from the eighth? Oh, sorry, I'm the eighth. Sorry, I can't even tell. <laughs> <laughs> That's not worrying me, isn't it? <laughs> And I realised when the, we all traipsed upon the, the, you know, the stage that we were all women and we talked about EDI. But anyway, this is quite unusual. <laughs> um, originally, when the group started, it was all men. So it's quite nice it's still on the other way. And maybe the pendulum will go the other way as well at some point. But at the moment, it's nine to three ratio. Um, so as well as myself, we have Annette Fayer, uh, who basically is our secretary. And she does an incredible job of holding the group together, making sure we do the right things at the right time of year, like overseeing the grant process. And we're putting together all the minutes of the meeting and making sure the AGM runs smoothly. And um, Kat Booth-Jones, who does our newsletter, please submit your stories to keep going with that. Again, she, you know, she really seems to enjoy that. And she, you really enjoy the outreach side of that, don't you? Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Danny, Danny's overseen the overhaul of the paper format for people joining the CBO group to, you know, membership mojo, which has been a fantastic mission. And she had the foresight to develop the merchandise as well on Tees Mill. So if you've not, you know, signed up. But the T-shirts are amazing. They're really, really beautiful. And some of them, you know, we supported, like, people in pride in Seaburg community. So we had a special section and we helped raise money for LGBTQ. <laughs> Alex, you've told me off this as well, haven't you, before? <laughs> LGBTQ plus... STEM, yes, hooray, right. <laughs> I speak very fast when I'm on the stage and I need to slow down. But and it's essentially, you know, and it was, there were some fantastic designs, so go and have a look and buy. Um, Zoe's done a fantastic job as well on the early career stuff. Um, Ruth has led the way with the Twitter, I mean, fantastic, you know. She's basically been tweeting the hell out of this conference, I hope you're all liking and retweeting, but also keeping us all in the loop about general seabird news. So, you know, again, followers on Twitter. Um, Leela, again, I need I say more. You saw the work that you basically, you know, she's led the way in terms of getting the talk in today, uh, but also putting together, you know, our EDI work, you know, what we're committing to, our statement, how we're going to make things different. And Kirsty, again, has done an amazing job in supporting um, Kat with the newsletter and social media stuff, you know, and Facebook as well. But she also is a representative for World Seabird Union. So she's our link to them. So she goes and sort of talks to them and keeps us in the loop. So people are stepping down, though, sadly. So whilst it's kind of sad and, you know, it's going to change the dynamic of the group, but hopefully, you know, just be different, you know, um, not worse. But essentially, um, these roles are up for grabs. So the first one is newsletter editor. Second one is membership secretary. Third one is social media manager. Fourth one is early career representative. And the final one is a new role. So Will has stepped down because he was originally leading the census work and helping administer the grants. But now um, we tried to change the title to give some longevity to that role and say it was about seabird monitoring. And he said, not one person has approached me to talk about seabird monitoring. So we said, okay, let's change that role. So that role now is about supporting the journal because it just needed a little boost. And Ruth has been terrific giving Viola a little boost in terms of getting things up and running again because we'd, we'd hit a little bit of a bump with the journal. And that's all been resolved. So my huge thanks to Ruth for helping us through that difficult process. Anyway, um, I'm not going to keep you any longer, but I just wanted to say thank you all for coming and any questions while I'm here. I think everyone's just desperate to go home. Well, we'll go to the wine reception, yeah? <laughs> but yeah, but do talk to us. Now you know what you look like. If, you know, basically, we've all got these green badges on as well. Sorry, looking the wrong way. But <laughs> I don't get out very often. But yeah, so essentially, but you can come and find us. Please do come and talk to us. We'd really love to speak to you. Okay? Thank you, Liz. Thank you very much.